I would like, first of all, to introduce Stefano. Stefano Di Setti is Associate Professor and Director of the Space Engineering Research Group here at UCBM. He got his PhD in 2013 from the University of Naples, Federico II. And his main research interests are in the field of uh, development of optical measurement techniques for fluid flows, data-driven techniques, and machine learning applied to flow measurements and flow control. As I was mentioning, he's the principal investigator of the ERC starting grant NextFlow, and he's going to be talking about the project today. He's also a member of the editorial board of the uh, Journal Citation Report, Journal Measurement Science and Technology, of the Scientific Committee of the International Symposium of Optical Image Velocimetry, the Scientific Council of the International Center for Heat and Mass Transfer, and of the Steering Committee of the Special Interest Group on Particle Image Velocimetry of ERCOFTAC. Okay, thank you, Manuel, for the very nice introduction and uh, welcome, everyone. It's for me a real pleasure to be the first speaker of this uh, uh, Aerospace Science and Technology seminar series. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about uh, my ERC project NextFlow. Uh, the title stands for Next Generation Flow Diagnosis for Control. Um, I'm going to give you the roadmap a bit of the objective of the project, which is basically aimed into uh, changing the paradigm by which we measure flows by embedding deeply machine learning and try to orient the output of flow diagnostic to more, more towards something that is more, let's say, oriented for flow control. Okay. So this is uh, a bit the map. Let's start uh, with uh, the need. I think uh, we all have clear that active flow control is something that is a huge reward ahead. And we all know that turbulence is ubiquitous here. You see beautiful examples of simulations uh, of the flow, for instance, around the buildings in a urban flow environment during a hurricane, or the very complex flow on, on top of an airfoil, as well as the uh, coherent structures that are delivered in the wake of a, of a bumblebee uh, during flight. So uh, clearly, say, uh, these are just a few examples, but turbulence is everywhere in practically all application we think on uh, in aerospace science and technology, and, and evidently the design of, uh, of devices in, in aeronautics especially, well, has to stand uh, with something that has to do with the behavior of turbulent flow around them. So for instance, the streamlined body of, uh, streamlined shape of NACA air is something that is guided by, by the flow behavior around them. Now, uh, this is, a, a, in a sense, a passive way of looking at the design. If we have the possibility of tampering with the unsteady, chaotic behavior of these turbulent flow, you see this richness of structures uh, in an active way. So if we can sort of implement an active flow control, then we can have big rewards in terms of, uh, of performances that we can uh, achieve. And just to give you an example, this is a recent work in which uh, deep reinforcement learning has been used to control the wake behind the cylinder uh, you know that a cylinder passed a certain Reynolds number, delivered a periodic wake, a shedding wake, which delivers oscillations in the lift coefficient and the drag coefficient. And if you train two actuators here, they're not visible, but they're basically two little uh, jets in this position that I'm indicated. Well, what you can do is train a neural network uh, to try to suppress or at least reduce the intensity of these vortices and play with, with the, uh, the um, uh, forces that are acting on the cylinder. Now, this is quite a complicated problem because turbulent flows are, are really hard when, you, when it comes to determining control strategies. Uh, on one side, because their behavior is highly nonlinear and the bigger gets the Reynolds number, the worse the things go. And it is high dimensional. As you see, there's a large chaos of structures evolving on a, a large dimensional manifold, so it's very difficult to identify control strategies. Uh, what are the tools that we have available? Well, uh, we have several tools, but all of them have some limitations. Uh, we have, let's say, two big parties. On one side, there is simulations. Uh, the best thing that you can imagine is doing a direct Navistock simulation. Uh, it is nice because it gives you a full flow description. So you have on three-dimensional domain, the full velocity description, as well as thermodynamic variables, like the pressure, the temperature, concentration of scalars. The problem is that they're very computational intensive, so you cannot think of having a controller that on the flights computes Navistock simulation. And in some cases, well, as you increase the Reynolds number, you cannot even think of doing a DNS with, uh, uh, with the computational power we have available today. So what you can do is the weekend a bit the hypothesis. You can go towards other alternatives, which are more affordable, 
about uh, need models. So in a certain sense, you need to validate something and you do it with experiments most often. And if you want time resolution like you have it for LES, well, still the computational cost is prohibitive, especially high Reynolds number. However, what you get uh, is something that is really nice. This is an LES of a turbulent boundary layer. Uh, you see these uh, air pin vortices which grow up. You can clearly identify this multi-scale dynamics, which at the beginning is alternate and then it gets more and more chaotic. Uh, however, uh, even if we have a three-dimensional, uh, and actually I would say four-dimensional because you also have time, description of the flow, well, this comes at uh, a high computational cost. This simulation is, a, is a kind of a massive simulation. If you move on the side of experiment, and this is a practical all what Nextflow is about, uh, we don't need to put models or assumptions. This is a very good thing. In a certain sense, experiments are pure from this, from this viewpoint. And virtually, we don't have limits on Reynolds number, provided that we have facilities to reach the Reynolds number of our application. On the other end, and then it's where it comes to the bad news, we have an incomplete flow description that is limited in accuracy and resolution. When I say limited, I mean that most often we have something like this. This is the same kind of flow. It's a turbulent boundary layer that we measured at KTH. Uh, it's a PAV measurement. Uh, it's a planar, so we just see a two components of velocity in a plane. So you see that we don't see a full three-dimensional description. And also, unless you don't have very expensive equipment, which is also difficult later to apply for, uh, to use for analysis number flows, what you end up is having snapshots that do not have time resolution. So you have pictures uh, that are statistically independent, which is nice if you want to get statistics, but it's difficult to get then the dynamics from there. So the question is, and this is really the core of next flow, can we achieve a complete and accurate flow description also in experiment? Can we use the new tools provided by machine learning in some way to obtain something that looks more like what we have on the left? Let's say a three-dimensional, uh, three-component description with also time resolution. This is the question we want to address. So we go back now to the hypothesis. What are the hypotheses, the pillars behind NextFlow? Well, the, uh, the underpinning of the projects is using optical techniques, which are nice because they are not uh, intrusive. Uh, so they don't disturb the flow significantly, which is nice because you don't have to take into account of intrusiveness and of perturbing the flow. And uh, we're going to build upon tomographic PAV. Tomographic PAV is a, a relatively recent technique. Um, it's getting to mature states. It's about 10 to 15 years old. Uh, the idea of tomographic PAV is relatively simple. You just need particles that seed the flow, so very small micrometric particles, which are, uh, track, let's say, with the accuracy of the flow. And then if you have multiple views that simultaneously look at this cloud of particles, if you have multiple projections, you can use a 3D reconstruction algorithm to get the cloud of particles. And then what you can do is that if you take pictures with a short time separation, you can track those particles and have a three-dimensional uh, flow field with the three components of velocity. This is really nice, and we uh, got over the years interesting results. This is a result from uh, uh, my previous group uh, in, uh, in Naples, uh, where we measured the flow uh, at the exit of a swirling injector. Uh, this is the result from the group of TUDELF, one of the maybe the first application of tomographic PAV in the wake of a cylinder. And this is the most recent one from DLR. Uh, you see that it starts already looking like the LS I've shown before. This is uh, indeed a boundary layer flow. Uh, but this is obtained with uh, uh, high repetition rate expensive equipment, okay? So uh, the nice thing would be that if we have the three-dimensional three-component flow field, and in these techniques we have experience, so there's a quite a good opportunity to have it, and tomography is demonstrated of being flexible in many flows. And if we also had time resolution, that would be really nice, because if we could enter into the Navistokes equations, and we would have everything uh, also the Lagrangian acceleration. The only thing that will be missing is the gradient of the pressure. So we can actually get out the gradient of the pressure from here and uh, compute the pressure after integration. Really nice. What is the problem then? The problem is that time resolved measurements are often unfeasible. Uh, you need a very expensive equipment uh, and also uh, equipment for PAV in a, a high speed is less performing. We have less power of the laser. The quality of the images are poorer. So uh, what we have to stand in most cases is something like this, what I've shown before, say known time result, planner, or maybe 3D measurements. And so forget about using the numbers. Don't have range and acceleration, so you cannot get from there the pressure. 
The second thing is that results are rendered by limited accuracy and, uh, and resolution. You see here that it appears some, some noise. Okay, these are not as clean as the movie I've shown before from the LES. The barrier, uh, well, uh, we don't have an output that is directly suitable for flow control. We really aim to have something like uh, an equation of the dynamics. We actually have model the dynamics of our system in terms of actuations, in terms of local state, and in terms of disturbances, uh, but we don't have it from the experiment, unless we don't use very expensive equipment. This is what we will exploit in, uh, in next flow. And now let me go to uh, the main pillars of the project, which are the, the objectives. Okay, so there are three main lines of research, three main work packages. Uh, the first one is achieving the complete flow description. The second one is uh, improving the resolution and precision of optical techniques. And the third one is using methods for system identification with the idea of going towards flow control. So regarding the first work package, the idea is the following. If we have available a standard uh, planner or 3D PIV measurements without time resolution, what we can do is try to learn the time resolution using fast probes. So the idea is that if you coupled if you couple your PIV with probes that go sufficiently fast, and when I say fast probes, I'm talking about hot wires or pressure transducers, probes that are normally cheap and can easily go to tens of kilohertz of velocity, while while PIV has a repetition rate normally blocked to about 10 or 15 hertz. Well, if we uh, teach the probes to reconstruct fields, we can have time resolved velocity fields. So really nice, because now that we have time resolution we can go finally in the Navistokes equation, like if we did it with the expensive equipment, we did it instead with standard one, and we can now get the gradient of the pressure. So we have now a full flow description. And this is done with standard equipment. Planner PIV uh, and uh, probes are available in many labs, and three-dimensional PIV is now starting to be more uh, available in, uh, in labs. The problem is that we require very robust methods for field estimate. And that is because later we want to integrate, integrate and get the pressure. Okay, so we need to have methods that are very robust and we are going to exploit uh, many of the methods based on, uh, on neural networks to do that. The second principle is the uh, high resolution enhancement, so say the beyond Nyquist principle. Uh, the idea is the following, if we use PIV, we can only sample structures uh, as far as we can put particles inside them. So which means that we can sample structures are sufficiently big with respect to the spacing of the particles. So imagine that I have these velocity vectors that I've obtained by tracking my particles. Here by high, uh, I see that this vortex is sufficiently big so that I can safely say that this is a vortex, okay? And I can interpolate on the grid that I want and obtain, for instance, this is the velocity into this direction, okay? But if I zoom in on a much smaller structure instead, and I have much less vectors, then here it's very difficult to imagine that this is a vortex. Uh, I can interpolate and I get something that doesn't have to do anything with, with a vortex instead. So I'm sort of locked into measuring only things that are within the Nyquist sampling, the Nyquist uh, limit of the spacing of my particles. However, if I know that I can only pick solutions satisfying these vectors, into the dictionary of vortices, well, maybe I find one or just a few solutions which are actually suitable uh, for uh, this kind of uh, vector realizations. And this is indeed the kind of game we play every time we uh, try to solve a puzzle of the Wheel of Fortune game, right? We can put whatever letter we want here, but if we know that we can pick it only in a certain dictionary, then it's much easier to find the right solution. So the idea is that we want to combine incomplete snapshots to go beyond Nyquist of what we can sample. And that allow us to go much beyond the limits of the resolution that normally PIVS. We will exploit methods based on compressed sensing, on data-driven regularization. We already did something based on principal component analysis. And uh, now we're already exploring deep learning, the, uh, the tools that are offered by super resolution generative adversarial neural networks. With the nice thing that here we have a challenge, we don't have data of high resolution to train. So we cannot do exactly the same paradigm that uh, people in the machine learning, I think you lost again the presentation. No, you see it, okay. That the people in the machine learning community use, used to do. The last work package, uh, well, the first two are already ongoing work. Uh, if you want to know more, just use the question and answer session later and we can dig more into that. The last one is that now that we have the complete flow information, 
we might be interested in knowing which is the dynamic. So uh, we want to identify, let's say, a, a sort of um, model for, for the dynamics of our system. And the idea is that we want to embed there the control as well as the disturbances and the local state. Now, if we have the uh, full description of the flow, what we can do is to exploit this I resolution information to build reduced order models. This X, the state vector, can be of billion points, can be the velocity in any points of our grid. But if we reduce our model in a smart way, then we might identify a few coordinates, just few of them, which control most of the flow, the bulk of the flow, and that's much easier for us to implement in a controller to be used in real time. So this is just an example of uh, the fluidic pinball. This is the wake of, of three cylinders. And now this complex turbulent behavior can actually be modeled easily in three components using manifold learners like ISOMAP. Okay, this is the work done by one of our PhD students, uh, SM Parzaminik. Okay, so this is it for the large overview. If you want to know more, uh, please feel free to ask in the question and answer session. And if you want to follow the advancement of the project, you can follow it on Twitter, or you can follow the outreaches on the Cordis portal, and the web page of the project is coming up soon, hopefully. Okay, thank you very much for attending, and I'll be glad to answer all questions you might have.